Let's turn in our Bibles to Leviticus chapter 18. We're going to look at chapters 18, 19. I thought we could do 20, but I can't. It's too much stuff. In 18, 19, it has to do with sexual perversion and uh, a very interesting topic when you look at this and where we are as a nation. And so don't be offended. I'm not accusing anybody or condemning anybody. God is. I'm not. It's just simply going to read the Word. But there is something that you need to know. God has a preference, and that is the way that God made man. And uh, you're going to see that so much has gone on since the very beginning of time where God said that He made a man and woman, and things have been changing. And no doubt, Proposition 8 came. It caused all kinds of problems, and we know that right now things are exploding uh, when you look at what's going on in the churches and the homosexual community and so on. What's happening a lot of times is that we've lost the love, and we need to love them and be able to understand what they're going through, but we also have to have an answer. And it's interesting when you really get into it how much guilt is there. And so there's a lot of things that people can say, but the Word of God is our basis, and so that's what we live on. We looked at this morning. There's an interesting thing. I read this little poem, O Lord, I bear an aching heart. Ease me of sin wherever the smart. Without within, I would be pure. Lord, hear my cry. Lord, work my cure. I know not what I ask, but give, O oh God, give me holiness. And I think that when we say, God, give me a, a pure heart, and God, make me holy, I think there's a lot of things that God's going to do. We saw this morning in chapter 18, verses 1 through 5, really that importance of kind of establishing the authority of obedience. And so he said, I, the Lord, spake unto Moses, and this is what God's saying, I am a God of relationship. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, I am the Lord. After the doing of the land of Egypt, wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. In other words, do not be like the Egyptians I took you out of. And after the doing of the land of Canaan, where I'm going to take you, I do not want you to copy them or their ordinances. In other words, do not imitate. So what a great, great, great marching order. I'm not to look back into what I used to be, and I'm not to be fearful of the future. If God pushes me out here, then God will give me the strength. But no matter where I go, if I look back for a few moments or look forward, I'm to keep the Word of God and the statues of God. Those are that the white lines that kind of keep me together. When I get out of those, I have a car that when I cross over the white line or yellow line and I don't have my turn signals, it kind of tells me, beep, 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 beep. You know, I guess it's to wake you up or something. But it's kind of annoying, and I guess uh, I just got to keep between the white lines because I'm like all over the place. But anyway, you know, it's just a cool thing. But it reminds you you're getting out. So he shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk therein. And then he says again in verse 4, I am the Lord your God. He shall therefore keep my statues and my judgments, which if any man do them, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. Excuse me. So in these verses, and here and then verse 6, remember in verse 21 and verse 30, I am the Lord your God. Six times in one chapter, he is establishing something very important, and it's called relationship. When my relationship with Jesus Christ goes south, I can do anything. In other words, I can fall out of love with my wife, I can go into perversion, I can go all kinds of places with my life. The thing that holds me together, the thing that really anchors my heart in that power of the Holy Spirit is that love of God and God loving me. And so it's really important. I mean, no other thing is more important than your relationship with Jesus Christ. And to know that if you look back into the past and see a bunch of scars and you feel like a victim, Jesus Christ is the Lord of your past. If you look in the present, He's here. If you look in the future, I can't do it, you can do it. You can do all things through Christ Jesus. So I just need to really take my eyes off myself and put my eyes on the Lord. In verses 6 through 17, and you can get the tape. We don't want to go back into that this morning. But in verses 6 through 17, God really begins to talk about this incredible thing of sexuality. And what he talks about in verses 6 through 17, let me give you a little nutshell. No mother, you cannot sleep with your mother, stepmother, sister, sister-in-law, half-sister, stepsister, granddaughter, or step-granddaughter, or stepdaughter, or daughter-in-law, or aunt, basically. That's off limits. 
You think, well, why in the world, Pastor Steve, would you tell us that? Because people do. People are just wicked when it comes to this area. And when Satan gets a hold of a person, anything goes crazy. Everything goes crazy. But God said, this is an abomination to the Lord. This is something I will not tolerate. And we know that here, Jacob did have two sisters, and they cursed his life. You remember Leah and Rachel. And so it was something that Laban did, and he had to suffer the consequences of it. But here it says in verse 18, chapter 18, verse 6, uh, concerning. Uh, Pat gave me something today that's really fascinating. Just step back and listen to this. The average person has their first sexual experience at the age of 16. I heard it's even earlier than that, like around 11. Pornography is a $60 billion a year industry globally. $12 billion of that is spent in America. $12 billion. $12 billion a year spent by Americans on pornography. This, let me put it in perspective, this is more money than is spent on pro basketball, baseball, football combined. Somebody would say America's favorite pastime is baseball. <laughs> I don't think so. More money is spent by Americans every year than on the average of ABC, NBC, and CBS combined in the last 10 years. That is frightening. The money that ABC, CBS, and NBC has spent, Americans have outdone with pornography combined. Americans have spent more money each year, at least $10 billion on pornography. That's more money than we've spent every year on foreign aid. That's tragic. And anyone just stop looking at the porn and give money. In other words, we could pay off the debt. Over 200 porn films are made in the United States every week. In one week, 200 porns. And I heard about this, and I couldn't believe it. 200 porns are filmed, are made in the United States each week. That's more than one an hour. Every hour, a porn thing is coming out. Porn sites are 12% of the Internet site. Porn is 25% of all search engines' requests. Over 40% of the Internet uses view porn. 20% of men admit to it that just admit to it. Accessing porn at work. 13% of women admit accessing porn from work. Every second, $3,000 is spent on porn in America. 28,000 Internet users are viewing porn every second. Every second. <laughs> this is, there's no hope. America and 372 Internet users every second in America are trying in words, looking for more porns. 90% of children between the age of 8 and 16 have viewed porn sites. The average child sees porn by the age of 11. Can you imagine Dad saying, Hon, I want to talk to you about the sex. <laughs> Dad, I've seen it in living color. The number one consumer for pornography is boys between 12 and 17. In a series, I had uh, parents say once again, 12 to 13, they were going to talk to the kids too late, too late. Additionally, one of the recent USA Today gave a future story on the fact that today junior high boys expect to have a naked photo in their junior high, on a junior high girlfriend in their phone, and we've dealt with that here at the church, 13 to 14 age. In addition, 10% of adults admit to being addicted to porn. It's much more than that. They say six out of, eight past, six out of 10 pastors are. And it says here, 28% are women. Isn't that amazing? Women. You say, well, women don't have that. You bet you, they do. They have that. They desire that. They lust after that, just like guys, and even more sometimes. The big myth is now beginning to turn aside. While only 10% of men admit to being addicted, 70% of men from the age of 18 to 34 have visited porn sites every month. This leads to the kind of addiction abuse. 55% of sex offenders and 71% of children molesters are sex addicts. One survey I read recently, 90% of prostitutes were molested as little girls. Another statistic said that a majority of women who are involved in porn industry are women who have been molested by their fathers. Now that's what we're up against as a church. So you see why when you look at the darkness of the world, the power of Satan, it is absolutely incredible. It cannot grab the way the Holy Spirit can, but it's doing a tremendous work. So kids come to church, they see nothing happening, they go right back out to what is happening. Porn is the number one thing in the world, and yet it's touched every one of our lives. And so as parents, you've got to be really aware of it. 
and hear a very sad thing. So here he says in verse 6, None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. Now why? Because here, when you look at this, half-sister, sister, granddaughter, basically when you look at porn, when you do all that, they are brothers and sisters and granddaughters and grandsisters. I mean, it's the whole gamut. And here we are looking at it. In verse 7, nakedness of thy father, or the nakedness of thy mother. She is thy mother. In verse 8, the father's wife you shall not touch. Verse 9, the nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, the daughter of thy mother. In verse 10, the nakedness of thy son's daughter, or the daughter of daughters. In other words, it's corrupt, it's perverse. It'd be like me going to bed with my son's wife. I mean, that is perversion. That is sickness. And yet, it just drives men and women berserk in their lives. And then it says here in verse 12, the father's sister. In verse 13, the mother's sister. And then in verse 14, the father's brother. Thou shalt not approach to his wife so, or the aunt. Now you're getting way up there. Thy daughter-in-law, thy son's wife. In verse 16, the brother's wife. Verse 17, woman and her daughter, neither shall thou take his son's daughter or the daughters of the daughters to uncover that nakedness. In other words, back off all things that have to do with the family. Get your life back under control by the Holy Spirit. So when I look at this, I begin to realize, God, we are in trouble. And here in verse 18, neither shall thou take a wife and her sister. So that would be living with two sisters. So we know that this is what happened with Jacob. He worked two years, uh, seven years for one, and then he was swapped and had two of the sisters, and they just drove him crazy, and they went back and forth. And so God says, don't do this stuff. In other words, why would I want to do it? Because something's missing in my heart. And so in verse 19 through 20, he talks about the purification here. God prohibits uncleanness. Now, some things have changed, I want to tell you, because when Jesus Christ died, then all the laws have been thrown out here in Leviticus because they were subject to Christ dying. He had fulfilled the law. So here it talks about that if you go to bed with a woman during her menstrual period, you will be condemned. Well, today, that really is not the case. Um, there are men and women who do that because of the timing of their marriage and so on. But in the old days, in the days before the law was given, when the law was given, it was unapproachable. Now, I personally believe the Bible says today the bed's undefiled. So if you both consent to it, then I can't say nothing about it. But if one doesn't want to do it, then you shouldn't do it. So it really has to be two yeses. It can't be one yes and one no. So the bed is undefiled. Whatever you can do, if you're married, if you're not married, get out of bed. That's what he's saying. And you might want to get out of bed real quick right now in your mind because Right before I get done with the study, or you're going to shoot me one or the other, but you're going to hear the truth. Thou shalt not approach unto a woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she is part of her uncleanness. That would be during her menstrual cycle. She'd have to wait seven days to after it was done, and then she'd be clean. If you touch her, you would be unclean, and then you'd have to sacrifice yourself. Now, today, that really doesn't apply. Again, it has to be two to give you uh, credence to do it. Uh, and then God prohibits adultery, verse 20. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife. So, you know, why are you looking over there? Why are you staring at her? Why are you looking out the window at her? Why are you looking at every woman driving down the street? You're going to cause a lot of accidents. It's an amazing thing to me. Women don't do that. Women just kind of drive. Eight, 10, 12. I mean, eight, no, was it? 10, 2. Every woman ever drives like this. Guys, women like this. And they're like... You don't see women like this. They never do that, ever. Guys are. I mean, it's amazing guys don't get more wrecks because it's like every car, they got to look inside. Who is it? And they run up, and it's this guy with long hair. Oh, what a drag. Kind of back down, you know. But not a woman. She just, you know, she's just kind of focused. She's going to work. And she's not looking, and maybe she is. I don't know. You can tell me afterwards. But I don't think so. I think you're just kind of focused. But there is that desire in you. And so, if you're not satisfied at home, you will be satisfied. No woman ever leaves her husband apart from another man in, already in place. So, there is a hunger, a desire, and that's why you have to keep that bed on fire. And otherwise, you, the husband's going to be looking out the window. And, well, I just don't like having sex. Well, you better learn how to have sex. 
You've got to learn to take care. In fact, your body's not even your own any longer. Once you get married, it belongs to him, it belongs to her. So, well, I can't do it. Well, you can sure take care of her. In other words, it's totally selfish not to take care of each other, whatever the needs might be. I can't believe I'm saying this on national television. But anyway, <laughs> it's as R-rated. <laughs> what can I say? So, fulfill the desire. Well, I don't want to. Then your husband's going to have a problem. And he's going to look, and there's going to be a woman who decks her bed. And she's going to have this ways to hell, and it's going to cause him to stumble. Well, listen, it'd be better to win him in bed and satisfy him in bed. And the Bible, even, even, we even know that if you kiss your husband before he goes to bed or before he goes out to work, most of those men and women make 30 extra thousand dollars a year. So I would just kiss your husband real good before he goes to work. <laughs> he might get a good raise because he's going to be one happy puppy. Well, happy guys don't get fired. Nasty dudes get fired, so kiss him. Put a big one right on his lip before he goes out the door. Honey, this is for your raise. <laughs> I'll see you tonight. <laughs> Call you. Huh? And you go to work. Hey, how are you doing? Let's get that. We got to get this done. We got to get home. <laughs> you get a raise. All right, 30000 That's how it works. Otherwise, it's, I'm so lonely. I'm so weird. I, I'm flirting after all the women. I'm touching all the women. And so you have a lawsuit. You got two canaries outside want to get in. They fight their life to get inside and go to bed with each other. You got two canaries inside that never do anything and want to get out. It's the most craziest thing. You got couples who are married that can't get to bed. You got singles who shouldn't be in bed hanging out with each other. The whole thing's messed up. So tell you what, listen to what I'm saying. Otherwise, the drive is there. Either you're bitter, you're resentful, you don't like each other, and listen, this headache thing doesn't work. So Let's deal with that right now. Get rid of the headache, and if you have a headache, take an Excedrin and hop in bed and call your husband. But don't say, I got a headache anymore. It won't work any longer. And guys, don't say, I'm tired. Just look at her. <laughs> you won't be tired no more. Okay. So the singles, hang in there. I'll get to you in a few moments. But here, then he says, <laughs> God prohibit killing in verse 21. The single's going to kill me right now. And thou shalt lest any seed pass through the fire of Molech. And this is what they would do. They'd have a, a god that was by Molech. And it had a, a stomach that was hollowed out. It was solid brass. They would heat this thing up, and they'd take a brand-new baby and throw it into the stomach of this uh, statue, and it would just fry the child. Well, we do the very same thing with a shot, an abortion. We kill 50 million babies. And so he's saying, do not kill. Do not put them through this thing. Mas, uh, Manasseh uh, sacrificed and did this, and he was dealt with it. Neither shalt thou profane the name of God. I am the Lord. Verse 22. He says, thou shalt not lie with a mankind. This is homosexuality. As with a womankind, it is an abomination. And this is what very simply, we see today happening more and more. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, and God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him man and female, created them. God had a reason for creating us man and female. We were to produce. And one of the things that's interesting to me is that here we begin to realize that what's happening is the whole family is being destroyed. Now, if I was the enemy in Satan and I wanted to destroy the United States and the world, I know exactly what i do. I would destroy the family. I would destroy the family, and by destroying the family, I would destroy the church. And so the family has been destroyed. We realize there are more divorces, more adultery going on right in this fellowship than anything else. More people are living in sin, and they don't think there's anything wrong with it. And that's why we're going to be dealt with and judged in a very powerful way. Children are growing up with no dads or whatever. And here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 34, let the husbands fulfill his duty with his wife, likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise also the husband does not have authority over his own body as the wife. So here, once again, is you're going to teach your children really what it is. And most areas of homosexuality start in the home. It's either a dominating woman or a dominating father. A father that treats his wife terrible and the daughter never wants to have anything to do with a man or vice versa. A son that never wants to marry a woman because of what this woman did to her own mom and dad. And so be careful. In Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22, thou shalt not 
lie with a mankind, like we said. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13, if a man also lie with mankind, he lieth with a woman. Both of them have committed an abomination. They surely will be put to death. Their blood will not be spared. In Deuteronomy 23, verse 17, there shall be no horror or daughters of Israel, nor sodomites and the sons of Israel. In other words, you can't have sodomites, those who are doing it. And in Sodom and Gomorrah, it was the uh, men who desired to go to bed with the angels, you remember? And God blinded their eyes so they could not touch the men of God. And Romans chapter 1, verse 26, for the reason God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women and change the natural function of which is unnatural. And in the same way also, men abandoned the natural function of women, and they burn in their own lust one towards another. And so God said, this is the things I don't like. This is an abomination. This is not the way I made man and women to live. And yet perversion is increasing more and more in our lifestyle. And it's a frightening thing because they're becoming very violent. Very violent. They're after the church. I watched a video the other night on the Mormons in Proposition 8. And I never really put two and two together, but the Mormon church gave $24 million to the cause of Proposition 8. And basically, they were the deciding factor. It wasn't the Christians. It was the Mormon church and the Catholics. They have a great value on family, and the Mormon church had to do it. And the reason why, when you are a Mormon, you believe that when you die, you are going to be a god. And you're going to have wives, and you're going to produce and have children, and you're going to have your own kingdom and your own planet. That's basically the theology of Mormonism. Well, you, if you introduce homosexuality in there, you destroyed your whole kingdom, the whole theology. So the 12 apostles of the Mormon doctrine got together, and they said, we can't have this. We cannot have this homosexual thing going on in the Mormon church. So they produced the money, did not want to be involved, gave most of the money to the work, and the Catholics and everyone else did it. But what happened is that many of the Mormons who were homosexuals now have turned on their parents because when the parents had to give them money, then they basically sold them out and destroyed their lifestyle when we won Proposition 8. And now it was an interesting film, I'll tell you. And so they are divided. Now they are coming against the Mormon church. They're rallying against the Mormon church. I mean, they're picketing the Mormon church. It's incredible. But they're violent. And they're going outrageously corrupt in San, uh, San, uh, San Francisco. And they're going to attack any church that attacks about it. This is what was passed concerning the hate crime in Canada. If I was to read Romans chapter 1, I'd go to jail because it was a hate crime. You can't even talk about it if you're in Canada. Well, we can still talk about it here, and I can still say it wasn't the way that God made it. It's because of the perversion of our heart and because of a need in our life, and most of all, oftentimes, we see more and more perversion taking place. And the Bible says in the very last days, this is going to be the end of everything. And so, very important to take a good hard look at this and understand what he's saying here. Also, he mentions one other thing. Just to give you a little insight, 74% of male homosexuals had more than 100 partners in their lifetime. Now think about it, they had AIDS. 41% of male homosexuals had had 500 partners in their lifetime. 28% of male homosexuals had over 1,000 partners in their life. So you see how rapidly that AIDS virus can go. Only 8% of homosexual men and 7% of lesbian women ever had a relationship that lasted more than three years. Now this is really interesting. 89% of homosexuals had used marijuana. 50% has used cocaine. 50% are using LSD. Now the question is, in straight, 25%, straight, 6%, and straight, 3%. Why? I personally believe they're trying to kill the pain. Because down deep, they think they're happy, but they're not happy. Other reports show that 30% are problem drinkers, 10% straight. 40% experience depression, 3% straight. 35% consider suicide, 11% straight. 18% attempt suicide, 3% straight. 80% have a history of sexual transmitted diseases. 30% are IV infected, 10% have AIDS. So when you look at the numbers, you realize this is something that is out of control. But how do you deal with it? Well, they think they're born into it, or they feel like they're do it. And as Christians, sometimes we don't love them. We're just so angry. Well, you can't get angry. You are to love people. You're to hate the sin. 
You're not to hate them. You are to reason with them, encourage them, and tell them there's a better way, and God can deliver them. And you have to stay faithful. But here, you're talking to them, and we're on pornography. What's the difference? You know? And here we're talking to them saying we hate it, and yet we are going after everything else but our own husbands and wives. So, or we're in bed with somebody else, or we're watching some R-rated movie with sex and everything else, and we're giving money to the devil. Can you imagine how many things you could do with that money? If everyone would stop putting the money towards pornography and towards the church of Jesus Christ, we'd solve the problem. But we love the darkness rather than the light. And so the relationship here is God once again condemns it in a very powerful way. He says here in verse 24, uh, and also bestiology, sleeping with an animal, verse 23, neither shall thou lie with a beast, or once again, any man or woman lie with a beast, so having relationships with animals. And then in verse 24 through 30, this is the reason why. Defile not ye yourself in any of these, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. Now Sodom and Gomorrah, you remember what Moses, um, Abraham said, God, if there are 50 righteous, will you spare it? I'll spare it for 50. Pre-aventure, if there are 40 righteous, will you spare it? For 40 righteous, Abraham, I'll spare it. Pre-aventure, Lord, if there's 30, for 30, 20, 20, 10, 10. But then he stopped, you know. And uh, God, there wasn't ten. And even um, it says of Lot, he was vexed. He couldn't even get his wife to get out of there. The angel had to come and grab his hand and pull him out because there was a vexation. Uh, there's a drawing. There's a pull. And for men, it's kind of not fair, honestly. Uh, we have this little gland right here in our brain. And, and when all of a sudden we see a really pretty gal, it just triggers and then you look. Now, if you don't turn your eyes and you look again, you're done. That chemical goes off in your brain, and now you start getting all weird. And now you start walking. Now you start looking. Now you start thinking. Now you start visually. And now you start everything else, all because that chemical. Now, women don't have that chemical. Thank God. <laughs> We'd probably never get out of bed if we all had that chemical. But the guy has that chemical, and when it takes over, it's an incredible thing because it just, it drives a guy. Well, what happens is we have, it doesn't work anymore in married couples, it seems like. It just works everywhere else. You got to get it working in the married couple. And so, you know, he's mad, he's angry, he's uptight. You know, fix it, fix it, fix it, fix it. But in your single lives, there's some great books, guys, you can read. And once again, every man's battle, turning your mind, turn and bouncing. And it's always the enemy. You have to turn. Don't be looking at it. I'm a, I got one eye. You got two eyes. I know. I, I lost one already. I'm going to take one more look. No, don't. Because it will drive you. It drives you, and that's what causes all kinds of problems in a guy's life. So here, he's saying in a very profound way, bestiality is wrong. And then he says, defile not yourself of any of these things. In these, the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you, Sodom and Gomorrah. They were completely destroyed. So much that it was Lot's daughters that you remember they were perverse. And Lot was going to give his daughters to these men. And they didn't want the women. They wanted the angels. So that just kind of burned up the cities. But when the daughters saw it, they thought, well, this is the end of the earth. So they got their dad drunk, and one daughter had a relationship. They got him drunk the next night. Another daughter had another relationship. They had two children, Moab and Ammon. Curse it be Moab and Ammon, because they hated the children of Israel. So when you look at everything, it produces evil. It just keeps producing evil over and over again. So when Israel came out, Moab would not help them. Edom and Moab, and so very selfish. Verse 25, the land is defiled, therefore, to visit iniquity there upon it. The land has vomited itself. And this is where we are today. I believe if you ask me today, see, where are we? It's right here. Ye shall therefore, verse 26, keep my statutes and my judgment shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of your own nations nor strangers that sojourn among you. In other words, you have to make a stand. Now, if the church can't do it, we're done. If we cannot make a stand, if we cannot be righteous, we're through. So that's the cry of my heart. For all these abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and the land is defiled. So this is where God took them. So this is what's really cool about God. He says, hey, this is where you're going to go. You're kidding me. 
Well, I thought we were going to go over to Hawaii, kind of just have, you know, no problems. No, I'm going to take you right in the midst of perversion. But don't you dare get perversed. Well, how can I not stumble, God, by having a relationship that's stronger than that perversion, Jesus Christ? So here's the question. Do you want to grow? I do. Do you want to excel? I do. Do you want to really find everything else that God wants for you? I do. Do you want the very best in your life? I do. Then God's going to take you down that road. He's going to take you in places that are evil, but you're going to have to be stronger than anything else. And that's where you reckon the old man dead. That's when you yield your life to the Holy Spirit. That's when you say no to sin and yes to God. And that's when you know that you're born again, spirit-filled, and nothing can touch you. You are here to make a difference. So that's what happened with, as the missions go out into China, the missions go out all over the world, that's what we can do. So God might take you somewhere or put you somewhere, not to condemn but to be a witness. But don't you dare go down that road. So how important is it? Verse 29, for whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even a soul that commits them shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore shall ye keep my ordinance that ye commit not any one of these abominable combina- uh, customs. This was the customs of Egypt and of Canaan, which were committed before you that ye defile not yourself. I am the Lord. So over and over and over again, God is saying, listen, you're going to be there. It's going to creep up in your homes. It's going to pop up in your family. It's going to come up among relatives. What are you going to do? Well, you're not going to get mad. You're going to get really righteously angered and solve the problem in a godly way. But if I'm messing around and doing it myself behind, I'm not going to say a word because I have no authority. So how important is this purity in your life? It's the power. It's absolutely power. When you are living it, you can talk it. When you're not living it, you don't say a word. So if you are messing around on the side and your girlfriends don't know about it, you're not going to stop them if they're messing around. And that's the problem. If you're not messing around, you stop them because you owe it to them to be strong in the Lord. It's so important. Chapter 19, holding us unto the Lord. He says, I, the Lord, spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation of the children of Israel, say unto them, Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. And this is what he says. Now, I want to give you a definition of holiness. Kind of cool. And verse 3, Honor your parents. <laughs> you say, oh my goodness, Stephen, you don't know who my mom and dad are. Ye shall fear every man, his mother and father, and keep my Sabbath. I am the Lord your God. Why? Because if you don't respect authority, you're never going to keep a job. You're never going to get higher, and you're never going to understand how to deal with authority, reckon with authority, do anything with authority, or understand anything about taking care of people. If you just reject your parents, then you have no heart. In other words, God... These are principles. My doctorate is in ethics. And so that is what I probably has kept me together all the years. There's a, a cause and effect. There's a right and a wrong. If I do this, this is going to happen. But if I hear, don't take care of the family, then I'm self-centered. Now, God doesn't want that. He doesn't want you self-centered. And then he says in verse 4, very powerfully, turn ye not unto the idols, nor make to yourself molten gods. I am the Lord your God. What did Aaron do? (laughs) Aaron lied. Well, we just kind of threw some gold in there, and out came this calf, (laughs) golden calf. Well, what did Moses do? You liar. He grinded it up, put it in water, and made them all drink it. No, you're not going to do this. This is the destruction of your life and your flesh. Do not have idols. And so don't make bosses idols. Don't make pastors idols. Don't make anybody an idol. You and God love the Lord with all your heart. Don't put people on a pedestal. This realize who we are. We're all sinners. And then in verse 5 through 8, he deals with a willing sacrifice. And if others offer a sacrifice, a peace offering to the Lord, ye shall offer it at your own will. Can I say very clearly, don't do anything you don't want to do. No one's forcing you here to do something. But if you do it, then do it all for the glory of God. If you're going to pick up a cigarette bread outside, don't complain about it. You pick it up for the glory of God. Or if you're going to give, you're going to give hilariously in your heart. You're not going to gripe about it. Or if you're going to get married, you're going to do it for the glory of God because you want to raise your family for God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all for the glory of God. Not in man's eyes, but in the singleness of God, I do it. So when I study, I don't do it for anybody else but for God and you guys. 
That, that's, that, that's the driving factor of our lives. Because if I try to do for you to please one person, it doesn't work. God will destroy it. He, he says in verse 6, it shall be eaten the same day, and just talks about this offering. In verse 8, everyone that eats it shall bear his iniquity because he has profaned the hallowed thing. He's just talking about a sacrifice, any sacrifice. Well, I'm going to sacrifice and stay late. I can't believe I had to stay here late and work for the church. <laughs> Jeez, I hear that all the time. Well, I'll do whatever God wants me to do. I got to work Saturday? You're kidding me. <laughs> I'll give anything to have this woman. Okay, you got her. I don't want her now. You got her. Anything. Yes, anything, God. Okay. I'll give my soul if I could be a musician. Okay, great, here you are. I don't even like singing. See, it's just like we make, we just talk. We make all these promises. We think that this is what I need, 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 this is what I have to have. I have a little sex here, a little sex there, a little this, a little that, a little excitement, and you realize, I'm tired. I don't want to do this no more. And all of a sudden, God says, well, what about all these promises? Well, God, I, 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 just, I was just talking. I know. Because you have no relationship. See, there's no relationship. See, a person that has a relationship are friends. We're friends. And you don't make promises. You, you go out and have dinner. You hang out together, fellowship together. You would never hurt each other. You never take a, a, advantage of each other. That's why, in some ways, I, I get angry with King David. Because when he committed adultery with Bathsheba, he violated, to me, the number one principle of all things. What people don't realize is Ahithophel, which was David's great counselor that made David great, who had the oracles of God that gave David everything he needed to have to be a great king, it was his granddaughter. Now, let me put it this way. Can you imagine if I went out with your granddaughter and took her to bed? Would you be mad at me? Oh, he burned my church down. See? So that's why Ahithophel was so angered, and that's why Ahithophel hung himself. So the next time, guess what? David and Bathsheba finally got married. She looked up at him. And all of a sudden, this is the man that killed my husband, Uriah. This is the man that caused my grandfather to hang himself. And this is the man that killed my baby. And now we're to have a relationship and be in love with each other. Well, praise God that she goes into the genealogy. And that's the goodness of God. But look at the damage done. Because a friend didn't and was not friend. So if I'm going to say I'm a friend... That means I hold you higher than myself. That means I don't violate you. I don't come against you. I don't violate you. I suffer the consequences, not you. And very important, I think in life you maybe have two, three friends, and that's about it. You have a lot of people acquaintance with, but friends you're willing to die for, and it's so important because it's hard to be a good friend and because you get so selfish in life. And here in verse 9, Minister to the poor, and when you reap the harvest, and this is says, very simple, ethics, when you do your harvest and land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners. Now, window would say, back up and get those corners. And God said, no, the corners are for the poor people. No, we got to get every bit we can get. No, leave it alone. In fact, take big swinging heaps, big round circles. So you have a square piece of land, you take a big round thing. Why? Each of the corners were for the poor people. That's how they fed each other. And so don't touch it. If you back up and went and got that, God would deal with you, take everything away from you. So don't do it. In verse 10, he says, thou shalt not glean the vineyard. So you have a vineyard, you're going to take all the grapes. When it says, go back and get all the grapes, you've got to sell them. No, leave some for the poor. Oh, how much? Oh, the whole row. Leave a whole row. Well, why? Because you love people. You feel sorry for people. You have pity on people. How much do you have to have? How greedy do you have to get? How much do you have to keep taking, taking, taking? I need, need, need. Well, after you have your 10 cars and 10 houses, why not just use your money for the Lord and blow the kingdom of God up and, and do something with the kingdom of God and come against Satan and destroy his kingdom. That's why God, God, God gave you the money. Not that you would use it for everything else, drugs and everything else. Use it for God, and God will give you more. In fact, you can't outgive God. You can give 90% of your income, and you can live off that 10, and you can be a multimillionaire. You cannot outgive God. And that becomes a great challenge in life, and some have done that. In verse 11, he says, deal honestly. This is so important. You shall not steal, neither deal falsely. In other words, I can do that. No, you can't. Well, yes, I can. No, you can't. Yeah, I can do finish work. Well, great. What do you have in your hand? A skill saw? Will you call yourself what? A finish, I'm a finished carpenter with a skill saw? I don't think so. So it'd be better for you to say, you know, 
I'm not real good at a lot of things, but I can learn real quick. I'm willing to learn. Pay me a little less, give me an opportunity. But don't lie, because you will be busted by God. And people do that all the time. They lie to get something, then they have to keep it. It'd be better to be honest and have, rec- and have somebody trust you for their honesty. Ye shall not steal, and neither shall ye deal falsely. Honestly, you work. Some people say, I told you before, hey, I've been here a long time. I haven't got a raise. Well, you've been here, what, 13 years? Yeah. Well, you've been here one year, 12 times. Yeah, well, you know, when, you're, when you produce like you did the first year, the second year, then you get a raise. See, you get raises when you produce or you, you, you give more, do more, bring things in. That drives a person. When you get lazy, I'm the same person 12 years in a row. Can't do that. It has to be a fire in your heart. And for Kevin and I, that means... We have to dig deeper. It's hard. New songs, new this, new that. But that's what we get paid for. That's what we want to do. And if we didn't get paid, we still do it. That's who we are. We have to do it that way. Deal honestly. And then verse 12, dishonoring God. And ye shall not swear by him falsely. In other words, don't take his name. No curse him. Neither shall thou profane the name of the Lord. And you can do that with vows. And then consider the service. Be kind, verse 13. Thou shalt not defame or defraud thy neighbor. Don't lie to him. Hey, can I borrow this? Can I borrow that? Rob him not of his wages. In other words, if a man is worthy, pay him. Give him double honor. In other words, do not muzzle the ox. Don't try to scam at the last moment to get a little bit more money. God will get even with you. Verse 14. Using others. Thou shalt not curse the death. Some of you do that with me. You just make fun of me all the time because I can't hear. Don't put a stumbling block before the blind. Don't do that. I had a dog, and he was a pug, and I kept kicking him down the stairs because he wouldn't go down the stairs. And finally, I took him to the doctors, and they said, well, he's blind. (laughs) It felt so bad. I shouldn't even tell you that. But poor dog was blinded. So I don't do that no longer. Come on, you can do it. Any dog can go down the stairs. Well, I guess not when he's blind, he (laughs) can't. So, you know, he's like, "Uh uh-oh, God and boy, when people heard that, they called the Humane Society, you know. In fact, Raul Reese heard it and went on public. Hey, you can put Pastor Steve's kicking his dog down. He's blind, you know. And, oh, my goodness. <laughs> Stumbling before. So be careful because, you know, hey, look at that person in the handicap. Oh, look at the way they're walking. Look at that. Look at that nose, how big it is. <laughs> God made that person. God made that nose. So why don't you tell God right now? God, I think you're funny. Why, God would say, I think you're funny too. Look at you. No, he wouldn't do that. Why would you do that? Why? Why would you put people down? Why is it in your heart to shame people? Why do you look at people? Why do you do that? Someone's overweight, you kind of make a hint. You kind of goof off. Someone's too tall, you make a hint. Leave them alone. Look at the heart. Well, look at the color. No, look at the heart. Who cares about the color or the way their hair is, or what they look like, or anything on the outside. You look at the heart of people, and that's the way he's saying. Then verse 15, you respect all people. You shall not do unrighteous in judgment. You shall not respect the person of low degree nor high. Do not elevate people or do not put people down. God will deal with you. So, you know, when people come here, they say, hey, we want to talk to you, and and where can we park? I said, anywhere. And he says, well, where can I meet you? I said, in the back of the church. And I found out he was assemblyman. <laughs> he, I think he was looking for a parking spot, but I didn't know that. And so he came to me and says, you know, I really like you. Why? Because you didn't show me honor. I said, well, no. You didn't die for me. Jesus Christ died. He's the hero of this church. He gets the front seat, not us. We're sinners. All of us are sinners. If I was with you, we'd be sitting together right there. Just sitting back and forth, but it's the grace of God. Jesus Christ is the one. It's much easier. Some churches give honor to movie stars. No, 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 no. They should be in the very back because they're not serving. In fact, one day when I get to heaven, the ones who have been given will be in front, and I'll be at the very back because I've been blessed. And that's the way it should be. And verse 16, oh gosh, help us. If you, does anybody have a problem gossiping? Just, you know, bad-mouthing people. Hinting to staff members. Okay. Thou shalt not go up and down the halls of Calvary Chapel South Bay talking about each other. (laughs) Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. I put that neighbor there. Don't talk behind his back. Verse 17. Thou shalt 
not hate thy brother in thy heart. Oh, God, help us. We have so much hate. We hate our relatives. We hate our friends. We just live in hate, and he sees, we see what's going on. Thou shalt in any way wisely rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. True love, in verse 18, thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. In other words, you don't have a time to be bitter and you don't have time to be weird because you need to keep your job. You need to do what's right. Verse 19, and this is where he talks about mixing things. You shall keep my statues. Thou shalt not gather the gender with the diverse kinds of animals. You will not sow the field with different types of seed, and you will not mingle linen with wool. In other words, God doesn't want you mixing all this stuff back in then, and God doesn't want me mixing my life with impurity or my life with carnality or my life with drinking. He wants me pure. In other words, if this is what I want to do, then I want to do it with all my heart. If I have a job, I want to do it for the glory of God. And then in verse 23, he says here, And when you shall come into the land and shall have planted all manners of tree and food, you shall count the fruit therein, the uncircumcised, for three years. In other words, God gave it so you don't touch it for three years. Now, this is just strictly what God said, and I don't know why. The fruit's there, it's yours, don't touch it. The fourth year, you are to give it to the sanctuary. The fifth year, you can have it. Maybe just to teach you patience. Don't touch it. <laughs> i got to touch it. Got to have it. No, don't touch it. And again, then in verse 28, tattooing. This is kind of interesting. You shall not make any cut in your flesh. That's cutting yourself. For dread nor print any mark upon you, I am the Lord. Now, I know this is the law, and people do it anyway. Well, I'm going to tell you my conviction. I think it's there for a reason, because I think that there are times that, hey, it's between you and God. I'm not going to cause a problem with it. But I do know the Antichrist is coming, and I do know that he's going to give you a mark. And if I was Satan, I would begin to condition people in two areas of their life. One, aliens kidnapping everybody. And second, it's okay to go mark your body because one day you're going to take the mark of the beast. So I think it conditions people rather than why are you doing it? Is there a purpose for it? Some people have come, they said, hey, I got a tattoo of a naked woman. Then put a cross over it or take it off, one or the other. So I realize you can do whatever you want, but I'm just telling you that when you start cutting yourself and marking yourself, this is, the one scripture I have is, it's not your body. It's your family's body, and it's not your body. Your body's been given to God. It belongs, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So be careful what you put on that temple. Because when you're there and you look at it, Though it was cool when you were on drugs, it's not cool now. So be careful. And again, if you have tattoos up and down your arms and you have them all over your neck, you better wear a long sleeve shirt and collar around your neck and go get a job. But if you go out and try to get a job like that, I don't think people are going to hire you. Just be careful. That's what I'm saying. Just be careful. Do not sell your kids. I know you want to. Don't. Do not do it. <laughs> don't, say, don't do it. It's wrong. And then in verse 31, we're getting to the end, degrading unholy things. Regard not them that have familiar spirits. So don't be messing with Ouija boards. Well, <laughs> just kind of got to mess with it. I tell you what, you're going to get possessed. Boom. Satan is going to get in. I believe that drugs is where Satan gets in. Pharmacia, the use of drugs. We get that word pharm pharma uh, pharmacy or pharmacia is that drug use. I think that it's an open door where Satan can get in through LSD, and many of us, Satan really did a number on our brains because of the drug situation. He says here in verse 31, Regard not them that have a familiar spirit, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord. I'll speak to you. Don't be superstitious. You don't have to wear the same underwear every single day. So you make it. Don't get fired. Just don't do that. Change it or you're going to get fired. You know? In other words, just use common sense. If God wants you to have it, it's going to happen. You're going to win the game, you're going to win the game. You know, football players are so superstitious. You know, they got certain ways, they don't change nothing, and, and they're, they're bizarre. Even some of the professional football things, when I talk to Maya McPherson, they have, you know, sorcerers, and they have people that hire, and people find out, and they put, you know, everything on each other's team. I mean, it's ridiculous. Nucomancing, talking with the dead. I'd be better talk with Jesus Christ because he holds the keys of life and death. You know, but we always settle for second best. So we'll take Satan. 
will take his demons. When the Bible says in the last days when Jesus Christ comes back, he'll look, and just his look will destroy the Antichrist and everybody else. One look. That's pretty powerful. And then he mentions be gracious, verse 33. If a stranger comes into your land, kick him out. No. (laughs) Be nice to him. A stranger that dwells with you shall be as one that is born among you. Are you kidding me? Bring him into your home. Thou shalt love him. I am the Lord your God. If you cannot love people, you're in trouble. Well, look at that bum under that freeway. You could be you. It was me. I was in the gutter. I weighed 130 pounds. I was on drugs. I had a bullet through my leg, and I hadn't taken a bath for three months. But a 65-year-old couple took a chance and took me inside their home. I would have never done that. To this day, I don't know if I'd do it, but they did it. And she said, surely, she said, I see something in his eyes, Henry. I see Jesus. Let's take him in. They picked me up. I couldn't even walk. They took me inside their home. They fed me. They put me inside the shower. They took me to Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. I got saved. I'm here today because someone was willing to love a stranger. Some have entertained angels not even knowing it. So when I start pointing or condemning, my children pick it up. It's pretty sad. You shall not do unrighteous in judgment. And measurements, weights, or quantities, and this is basically what the Jews did so well. They had two sets of weights, selling and buying. And they used those weights effectively. We do that today. Well, this and that. If I do this, I get that. If I do that, I get this. I get this day, that day off. That day, this day. So there's no sacrifice no more. How about just doing it for the Lord, period? Don't be dishonest. Don't try to scam. Be known for who you are. Be known for your character. And be known for your honesty. I'll tell you what, that's what's going to happen. That's what's going to take you the furthest. Use honest scales, honest weights, and honest measures. And that's what I think we should do. We should be honest, ethical. Therefore, verse 37, thou, Therefore shall ye observe all my statues and my judgments. Do them, I am the Lord. So I guess in summary, what he's saying is that the reason why people turn to homosexuality or the reason why people end up in adultery or the reason why people end up, you know, prostituting themselves or selling themselves is because they have lost their relationship with Jesus Christ. They're looking for something. And they're throwing themselves and blaming everything else in this world at what has happened to them rather than to look to Jesus Christ and say, I need you as the Savior of my life. At any time, I can turn. At any time. I did when I was 20 years old, I turned. That was 40 years ago. Oh, you can turn at any moment. But you have to be honest. Why am I doing what I'm doing? I feel guilty. I feel bad. I know I shouldn't do it. I know I shouldn't date a non-believer, but I do it anyway. Well, then listen to your heart. Your heart is condemning you. If our heart condemns us, we have one greater. It's Jesus Christ. If your heart doesn't condemn us, then you can have great confidence with God. So the way I live my life is pretty simple. If I get convicted by the Holy Spirit, I know I'm wrong. So I'm not going to justify it. If I make a mistake, I'll come before you and tell you I blew it. But I'm not going to say here, and you made me do it, or I did it because of pressure. No, I made my own choice in life. I did not listen to the Holy Spirit. I did not listen to the Word of God. I did not take heed. And because I'm doing what I'm doing, God has proven once again that I cannot govern my life. So if I return and repent, God will forgive me. He'll make all the years of the canker worm be gone, and God will restore my life overnight. It's a great God. But if I don't listen, I'll be cut off. So important.